Hello, my name is Peter Balverbeek, and I was asked by Herman Offerhuis, the chair of the University Wide Ethics Commission, to say a little bit about the ethical work that I'm engaged in from my own work within the philosophy department of the University of Twente and within the design lab. So I'm, of course, very happy to, to do that. Um, and I would like to focus on three uh, things, three elements of uh, the work that I'm currently engaged in as hopefully some kind of an, an inspiring background uh, that could maybe somehow uh, be of relevance to the work of the University Wide Ethics Commission. First of all, I would like to tell you a little bit about UNESCO and about all the ethical activities that take place within the context of UNESCO regarding the ethics of science and technology. Um, it's actually in three different ways. First of all, the work of COMES, the World Commission for the Ethics of Science and Technology that I'm chairing a group of 18 people uh, from all over the world writing studies about ethics of science and technology. And secondly, the work on artificial intelligence, where UNESCO is quite active at the moment. And third, maybe also the importance of the recommendation, a normative instrument that UNESCO published uh, on the, well, the status of scientific researches, which has a lot about well, the ethics of doing science. The second line that I would like to open is the work that the Academy of Sciences is currently doing on the freedom of scientific pursuit, of academic pursuit. There's a committee for this, which I'm chairing, which has recently published a study, a report basically on academic freedom, what it means, how to secure it, but also what kind of well, you could say uh, what kind of responsibilities it, it brings for scientists and also for universities to deal with academic freedom in a, in a good way. And the third line that I want to uh, tell you about is the guidance ethics approach, a very applied ethical approach that could help uh, scientists, engineers to develop uh, technological innovations in a responsible way. It was developed in the triple helix, as you could say, uh, from ACP, a platform for the information society where companies, governmental organizations and academics come together. And we are currently expanding the methods also, the method also to what you could call the quadruple helix, where also citizens are engaged. So citizen ethics could be the word to describe that. Let's first uh, go to the UNESCO framework. Um, within the context of UNESCO, there's a lot of ethical activity taking place. Maybe it's also good to uh, mention that, um, well, UNESCO is deep placed within the whole UN organization where ethics takes place. UNESCO is uh, the organization for education, science and culture, and also communication. Uh, an organization that was established uh, after the, uh, the Second World War with as its mission to, to bring peace in the minds of, of human beings, as it were. And the slogan is, uh, since war starts in the minds of human beings, uh, peace can start there as well. And um, well, ethics is actually quite an important thing uh, in what they do there at UNESCO. COMEST is uh, the first uh, thing that I want to tell you about. So there's this worldwide commission on the ethical science and technology with 18 people from all over the globe uh, working on, uh, well, writing basically reports, ethical reports that inspire the policy making of the member states. And the reports uh, that we write, write typically partly about the current developments in technology, typically digital technologies, and partly on well, ecosystems, climate and sustainability. And so we've written reports on robotics ethics or the ethics of Internet of Things, the ethics of artificial intelligence, but also on land use ethics, uh, water ethics. And we might also work on geoengineering, climate engineering, on, on the air, on, on space, as it were. So that's what we do. Uh, and this is also, I think, a very important venue to get inspiration from also as a University of Twente, which wants to be this, well, society first university uh, where we do science from society. And the whole idea of intercultural ethics is becoming increasingly important, I think. And the whole ambition, even the very fact that there is this building in Paris where the whole world can come together to discuss ethics and to reach an agreement and also to discover where we are different is very, very interesting. And of course, the main line of discussion is always, uh, well, the differences between the Western approaches that are typically focusing on the individual and the approaches from basically all other places in the world where the community has a more central place how to bring these two together, how to uh, be open for the differences and also try well, to arrive at conclusions that could be of value for the entire world. Um, 
Well, in commerce, we also do other things. So we are also organizing roundtables, for instance, regarding artificial intelligence. We brought together interesting speakers, organize a roundtable in Paris, videotape it, put them online uh, so that people can, uh, can watch this. And the most recent one was actually on intercultural ethics uh, with a very uh, interesting combination of people uh, speaking about, uh, well, how intercultural ethics can inform policymaking and inform policymaking, but also how, uh, for instance, from uh, uh, an Asian perspective or from an indigenous American perspective, you can have different angles to think about artificial intelligence and uh, what. Well, how we could get inspired, learn from each other there. That's Comest. Um, Comest has also been working on uh, a study on the ethics of artificial intelligence, as I said, and I was at the special request of the director general of UNESCO, who, when she started to be the general director, from the first day said that artificial intelligence needed to be at the heart of the work of UNESCO. I think a very good decision. Also an understandable one, maybe in a sense, because UNESCO, of course, being about education, science and culture, it is about the mind. It is about how we think, how we understand the world. And exactly there, AI works on us human beings. So she asked uh, us as Comest to write a report on the ethics of AI. Interesting thing, because of course, we are only a very small committee within that huge UNESCO organization, and suddenly we uh, were in a position to really help think about the directions that UNESCO uh, could take. On the basis of that, the Director General decided that there should be a recommendation on the ethics of AI. So a recommendation, that's a typical uh, uh, well, language use in those circles. It is a normative instrument that is a bit stronger than a declaration. A declaration is basically a statement that countries make, can also be strong. The human rights is a declaration. It's still very strong and people really feel committed to it. A recommendation is stronger in the sense that uh, member states also have to explain to what extent they followed the recommendation. They have to report about this every so many years. And uh, that was a different kind of trajectory. So now there was an ad hoc expert group working on a recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And actually that process is at this very moment that I'm speaking now. Uh, so uh, April 2021. Um, on the negotiation with the member states. So the member states have also processed the text that we experts made. And currently there are negotiations about the text that hopefully could get uh, adopted in November. And then it would be this, well, legally binding instrument for all the member states. Very inspiring work. Also, I think work from which we as the University of Twente can really learn as a very international university, a university that also does a lot of digital technologies this whole discussion that took place there and the way in which, well, different angles, uh, perspectives in a political sense, in an ethical sense, in an intercultural sense, played a role can really also be inspiring for the work that we do at the University of, of Twente. And the third line, as I already said, is this recommendation on the status of scientific researchers. Really worth checking it out. This, the, the, this text is already quite old, but it got an update just two years ago or something, actually a Dutch, uh, um, um, well, made some kind of a nice folder, nice text, nice kind of brochure about this um, new text of the, of, of the whole recommendation. That's also a very inspiring framework for thinking about, well, how um, member states should deal with scientists, with their freedom and with their responsibilities, but also how science connects to society. It really connects also quite deeply to the idea that, uh, well, um, uh, taking part in the fruits of scientific research is actually part of the human rights declaration. So that's the recommendation on the status of scientific researchers. So UNESCO, a very international context, a context that fits, I think, the international character of the University of Twente, and where ethics does not so much play a role as an instrument to assess technologies, even though it's still very normative. So it sets out frameworks, it develops concepts and language to address ethical issues. And uh, the recommendation is quite normative. It really says this should happen, this should not happen. The studies that we write with Comest mainly try to explore how new technologies urge us to ask new types of questions. And they always start from within, you could say. We don't start with the ethical concepts and then apply them to the technology. We start from the technology, how technology is challenging our society, and then we we'll try to formulate ethical concepts, frameworks that could help deal with technologies in a responsible way. 
So let's go to the to the second window then, the Academy of Sciences and the Commission for the um, Freedom of Scientific Pursuit that I'm chairing there. Um, it's a commission that has existed for quite some time already. It's also quite busy in, for instance, writing letters to governments uh, where uh, scientists are imprisoned, for instance, try to help them um, get free uh, if they are only imprisoned because of their scientific activity. But the whole discussion about the freedom of scientific research and academic freedom, if you want, um, took on a lot of new directions over the past decade or so. And there have been discussions in the Dutch parliament about, uh, well, actually the question if there is something like leftist self-censorship in academia. Uh, so can you really express right-wing views still? Because academia seems, according to some people, so dominated by left-wing people. And, and uh, well, questions like that have given rise to, uh, well, uh, the question to these, this commission on the freedom of scientific pursuits to come with an advice. And a few years ago, it was first a, a letter uh, which set out some kind of a framework, but it appeared that we needed more. So last year, we published uh, a full report, an advice, as it's called in academia, uh, in uh, well, academy circles, uh, uh, an advice on how to deal with um, scientific freedom, with academic freedom. And the whole point of the text is actually that we should make sure that uh, we, we safeguard that academic freedom in a good way. Well, before I go into the details of that report, let me say that it also, uh, well, builds on and is also different from another report, an old one that the Academy published about science on demand. It's a bit an older uh, advice, which is all about, well, doing scientific research in a context where external parties uh, well, hire you as, an, uh, as a scientist to do research. Of course, at our university, uh, the University of Twente, this is a very common thing. We do work with society. That's also what we want. The society sometimes also pays us for the work that we do. So how to make sure that the, the scientific work being done in that context has sufficient quality? So, so uh, in that... Uh, Advice, there are actually four, four main items that you could take into account. And it's really worth to dive into that if you want to have some guidance. The first one is independence. So it's really important that academics can do their work in an independent way. And that there's not too much interference from the external parties, at least no interference in what, uh, well, uh, scientists feel free to, to write down or to conclude. And then second, the freedom to publish is essential. And that's something that we need to secure if we do science on demand, as it were. It sounds, by the way, way too negative. I think science on demand, as if yeah, there is a customer buying science. And I think in practice, it's much more a form of doing science together with external parties. But for the sake of, of the argument, the freedom to publish is also important. So truth finding is central, of course, in scientific work. And you should never be blocked in publishing about the truth as science also needs to benefit from the work that you did on demand if you want and third is avoiding uh, too deep conflicts of intro actually avoiding them at all and making sure that they don't interfere at least with the quality of your work in order to make sure that the work that academics do stays reliable and now fourth the contracts and the contracts should always be made public that's maybe the most important thing so that everyone can check can see what was agreed upon if uh, you do research uh, well, uh, on, on demand. So to make sure that, well, everyone can see it, that it's somehow transparent. So as I said, it sounds a bit negative. It's maybe also an advice from, uh, well, some time ago, uh, where apparently, the, well, the, the, there was a tension that people felt a bit more strongly than nowadays between society and science. And I think the report on scientific pursuit on scientific freedom tries to take that a bit further. It tries to explain how important it is to make sure that uh, scientists can do their work in freedom, but that also actually they can do uh, that in such a way that they deal in a responsible way with their freedom. One of the observations behind the report, I would say, is uh, what I always like to call the science paradox. And that we put kind of conflicting demands on, on science. And so on the one hand, science should be value-free. That should be objective. That's true. But on the other hand, we want it to be valuable as well. And we fund science because it also has a value for society. 
Uh, it has to be neutral, uh, totally independent as it were, neutral, there should not be any color, any preference, but of course it's not only neutral, it's also influential. We recognize that science changes our society. It should be independent, but it should also be relevant. And so on the one hand, science needs to be something as it were isolated that can develop a total freedom. On the other hand, what it does in society is also important. And you can never deny that it also has a social implication. So what really uh, helps me to understand the paradox and its relations to um, uh, academic freedom is, well, ways to think about freedom. Berlin had this very, very well nice lecture, his inaugural lecture in Oxford in 1958 already, where he developed two concepts of liberty, of freedom, two ways in which we could understand what freedom is, and which is on the one hand negative freedom and on the other hand positive freedom. And negative freedom means freedom from, and the absence of interference as it were, the absence of things that make you unfree. But there's also a positive way to define freedom, and that's the freedom to, the freedom to do something. And the freedom from is important, of course, in the sense that you will not be coerced, forced to do specific things, and that you can indeed maintain, keep up, well, the room and the space you need to do your work independently. But that freedom itself is meaningless if it is not freedom that enables you to do something meaningful. And that's the positive dimension of freedom. The um, advice that we wrote on academic freedom actually works on both levels. So it, it tries to show that we need to secure freedom, but the freedom also comes with responsibilities. And we need to secure, secure it only at the level of the individual scientist, uh, uh, which is also, of course, very important that scientists individually have the room to do their work and to draw the conclusions that they think should be drawn, etc., to, to choose the methods that they find important. Also at the level of the institutes, they should also be free to have, have enough room to maneuver, not be forced into a specific angle or a specific approach by funders, governments, etc. And of course, also academia as such has to be organized in such a way that freedom is secured. And for instance, funding schemes should not result in the exclusion of specific approaches, angles, fields, etc. But at the same time, of course, freedom comes with responsibility. And freedom is not just the room to do whatever you want. And so it also shows the enormous importance of research ethics, but also of uh, taking care of the impact of your work for society. So responsible research and innovation is also very important. And the next line that is emerging uh, ever more strongly nowadays, I think, is the idea of open science. Open science not only meaning uh, uh, open access to the publications that we make, but also well, opening the doors and the window. Well, first we open the windows, people can see uh, all the nice things that are happening in science. Uh, so the ivory tower was already a bit open, but now I think open science also means to open the door. Eh? Or I like actually much more the metaphor of just putting the ivory tower flat on the ground and everyone can walk in and out. Yeah. Scientists, of course, but also governments, uh, also citizens, also companies. And together, actually, we start to do science. And so the whole notion of citizen science is also increasingly becoming important. Citizens start to participate in scientific research, just like companies have been doing that already for quite a while. It has a lot of implications for what good science is, how scientific integrity should be conceptualized, but also what academic freedom is. Scientists should still have the freedom to do the work as they want to do it, but maybe scientific freedom, academic freedom also applies to citizens who want to engage in um, well, scientific work. So that's about scientific freedom. Um, academic freedom. That was the second window and to answer on the request of what kind of works in ethics of science and technology I'm working on. Let me now focus on the last window and that's much more about my own research uh, that actually tries to connect ethics and technology in a very intricate way, trying to address how technologies themselves are, are ethical, how we can use ethical words to think about technology, which is not maybe the most self-evident thing to do because ethics is something that humans do and technologies are objects, are not human subjects, right? So how, how, to, how to do that? So let me tell you a little bit about that and also connect it to the work that we do at Design Lab, where um, actually, well, society and science and technology uh, meet all the time. And where a lot of these ideas about the moral significance of technology, uh, the impact also of technology on ethics can play a role. And 
I want to arrive basically at an approach that hopefully can be of any significance to the University Wide Ethics Commission by adding to the idea of ethics as assessment, as assessing a proposal, assessing a technology, assessing a request. We can also have the concept of guidance, guiding technology in a responsible way. And that's typically a result of the kind of research that I want to take you through very quickly. Um, and so very often we see ethics as, uh, well, almost something legal, eh? typically modeled after the medical ethical assessment committees that you have in many hospitals and we have to ask permission to do something and eh, it's approved or rejected. Eh? Ethics is then about yes or no, do we want it or do we not want it? And of course that is very important. So I, I mean, the uh, thing that I want to, 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 to tell you is not at all, all, I think that this is not important. It, it is very good. We should set uh, boundaries and make sure that we stay within the boundaries. But my worry is actually that if we only focus on uh, well, well, keeping out what we do not want, uh, the negative part, if you go back to the negative freedom, we forget to, to think about what we do want, what is valuable and how we could give a positive direction to technologies. So that's actually what I hope to add at the very end of this uh, short talk. And it's, it's almost over <laughs> and with the approach of guidance ethics. So maybe just to say a little bit about this moral significance of technologies. A long time ago, I studied ultrasound and the ways in which ultrasound informs ethical decisions that people make about abortion. Not to make any point about abortion, I'm, I'm not against it or something. Or it was just to understand how very, uh, well, deep ethical choices that people make are influenced by technologies, how they are not only our choices, but how technologies uh, mediate, as I like to call it, <coughs> the, the choices that we make. So ultrasound seems maybe like, uh, well, a nice peek into the womb. Huh? The, the, the print of the first uh, scan is typically the first picture in the baby album. But as soon as you make an ultrasound scan, a lot of things change. Actually, uh, the fetus suddenly becomes medicalized, you could say. And we see uh, the fetal body before it's born. That's totally new. And suddenly, we can also see, for instance, the thickness of the nape in the neck of the fetus, which can be an indication of Down syndrome. We see if the spine is closed or not. Huh? So there are a lot of things that you can see. We, we see the, the gender. Huh? We already gender the, the fetus. We can already give a name to the, to the unborn, which is quite a big thing. So in the old days, it would be fate if you would get a child with Down syndrome, for instance. And now we know it beforehand. So it becomes your own responsibility what you want to do with that. So suddenly expecting a child changes into choosing a child. Um, the, the fetus itself becomes a potential patient. Also, the, the role of the mother changes. In the old days, the, the, well, the body of the mother was always there also to get in touch with the fetus. And so it was a unity, the uh, pregnant woman and the fetus. And suddenly now the fetus appears on the screen and the mother is reduced to the environment of, uh, of the fetus. A lot of things change. And that doesn't mean that ultrasound forces people to have an abortion if they see that they are expecting a child with Down syndrome. But it shows that actually the moral relation between the expecting parents and the fetus is mediated and that our moral agency, if you want to use that word, is influenced, is mediated by technology. And the influence of technology on uh, ethics is an interesting thing to study. And it's not only the case that we can study uh, technology with ethics and with an ethical framework in our hands, we can say, hey, we do want that and we do not want that. It's also the other way around. Technologies inform the frameworks with, with which we evaluate these technologies themselves. And sometimes even at the level of what the values or the ethical concepts that we use mean. It's interesting to, to dive, for instance, into the history of anesthesia. Uh, where if, if you read old texts about uh, anesthesia, there were a lot of ethical concerns about giving people anesthesia during surgery. And it might sound absurd at first glance, but as soon as you dive into it, it's not as absurd as it might seem. The pain that you feel when you open the body was typically experienced as an important thing. <laughs> it's a signal that you should not go there. It's dangerous to open the body. And there was some kind of an integrity of the body that was at stake if you open the body. It was experienced as something totally disrespectful if you open the body uh, and, and, well, actually suppress that uh, signal, if you make people fall asleep and not feel pain anymore. 
Of course, it has totally changed by now. It would be totally disrespectful if a doctor would operate on us without anesthesia. So the meaning of the value of human dignity, dignified suffering, whatever you want to call it, has changed under the influence of the technology itself. Ethics is not an independent yardstick. And the thing that it tries to measure, as it were, influences the stick itself. And that makes ethics of technology a super interesting and complicated thing to do. Now you can even study that impact of technology on ethics empirically. And we did uh, an empirical study uh, on Google Glass <clears throat> by studying how people um, discuss uh, videos that people made with Glass uh, online on YouTube. When you instantly can see that the concepts they of all the, the, the way in which they define the concept of privacy changes uh, uh, and it's actually a different definition an implicit definition that they make than the definition that we teach our students it's not only about the right to be left alone as we always teach our students or the right to control your data or something people were really concerned about uh, how private a memory could be if somebody else could actually videotape it with Google Glass uh, on, on their face and share it with others. Uh, and so it was more about the privacy of being together. Well, there was a whole list of new definitions of privacy that were well, new. And of course, new technologies that intrude in our personal sphere will also well, have this new type of impact on what privacy means for us. So taking that into account means that, well, ethics and technology are closely in, uh, intertwined. And there are also se several ways in which they come together. I think the, the, the typical way in which people conceive of the relation is technology assessment. Ethics is an instrument to assess technology and the technology has impacts on society and we can study the impacts and evaluate them. Then there is secondly, this moral mediation and an impact of technology on our moral agency ultrasound is doing that or even more fundamental mediated morality ethics itself changes and the, the the values with which we evaluate technologies themselves develop an interaction with the technologies <clears throat> that we are developing so that calls for an extra approach in ethics ethics is more than assessing technology it's important that we do it and we should never give up doing it but that's really about saying yes or no it's kind of a legalistic approach ethics takes the role of a, of a court, you could say, uh, where I think medical ethics is typically the model for doing that. Uh, is it acceptable or not? Yes or no? Uh, the boundaries, and we should make sure that well, nothing happens that we really do not want to happen. Ethics as a guidance is something that moves the other way around. It's actually ethics from within. Uh, you, you try to address the ethical issues from within the technology, from studying how technology has an impact on society, not from outside. You don't start with a pre-given framework, you start from the, the, the impacts of technology. It also means that ethicists do not um, uh, well, lag behind, as people often say. Yeah? First, the engineers make something, and then the ethicists come and explain that that actually was not a good idea. And it also means that the ethicists should not walk uh, at the front and that would be the old fantasy of the philosopher king, maybe. Uh, that is not a very democratic, actually. It's kind of a totalitarian approach. No, ethics should stand next to technology. Study how technology affects our society. and Identify what's at stake in order to give it a positive, a, well, a good, responsible kind of direction. It also means that ethics can be more bottom-up and not only top-down. It's not only something that experts do. Uh, where they derive ethical theory from, from books, but it's also something that um, people in society do. The professionals working with the technology, the nurses and the doctors working with AI in healthcare, for instance, the judges uh, having to arrive at a verdict uh, at the advice of an expert system, they experience the impact. So they can also uh, uh, well, somehow articulate what is at stake. And also, again, that we could have positive ethics and not only negative ethics, connecting to the positive and negative freedom distinction that I gave. Of course, ethics should always also have the negative thing about keeping out what we do not want. But if we only do that, we leave the whole area empty where it's all about. Why do we develop this technology? So the positive ethics is about values, but the, 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 well, the freedom we have to develop something. And it's making room and shaping the conditions for what we do want rather than merely keeping out what we do not want. So the guidance ethics approach that we have developed with 
ACP, uh, ECP, as I already uh, said earlier in this talk, is all about this. <clears throat> so this is not an assessment tool. This is an a, well, accompaniment tool, you could say. It's also not a very deep scientific work. Eh? It's not going to be a Nobel Prize winning thought. It's really a tool eh, to connect ethical thoughts and also uh, well, uh, the ethical ideas that I just tried to give on the impact of technology on ethics itself, eh? to connect that to practices to enable people doing uh, science and technology to take ethics into account. So hopefully also people at the University of Twente who could be inspired by this, anticipating the impact of their work on society and taking it into account already now. And so what you do is you always start, well, it's actually an approach that has three stages, three steps. You start by getting in touch with the technology in context. And so if you do it with a panel of people uh, who are experiencing the impact of a technology, well, somebody will explain it. And so we've done this, for instance, with regard to the Corona Melder app. Uh, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, the, the app that has been developed uh, in many countries, actually, but also in the Netherlands, to uh, trace if you have been closer than one and a half meters for more than 15 minutes to somebody, uh, because if that person then would later appear to be infected with the virus, you can get a notification that you have been in a risk situation. Quite an intrusive technology. Yeah? A lot of things are at stake. Yeah? The relation between the government and the citizens privacy, etc. So we did a session with the citizens and with all kinds of professionals with this guidance ethics approach. And then the first step is <clears throat> to let the head of the design team explain the app, <clears throat> explain uh, the whole data infrastructure behind it. Uh, where is the data stored? How, how, how does the app look? How, how do people use it? How can people use it? How will the results end up at the healthcare services, at the, the, the GPs, at the hospitals, etc.? Getting in touch with the technology. Then an important step <clears throat> is actually step two, step of dialogue or you start by identifying the actors so the people who might be affected by the technology and so for the the app it's of course the citizens using it but maybe also the supermarket owners the people who who own a swimming pool who work in a soccer stadium the people who are affected by the lockdown and who might have of, of well, uh, a role in reopening society for instance by making sure that people are not affected when they enter the supermarket so the actors then the second step is to see what kind of effects the technology has on the actors, what kind of impacts it has on how they behave, how they, they work together, how they perceive the problems, in order to arrive finally at the values that are at stake in those impacts. And if we have a list of those values, then we can do the, the real thing. And the real thing is not that with those values in hand, you can say, yes, I want it, or no, I do not want it then actually the whole work starts of making these values actionable, if you want. So how can they inform a redesign of the technology? Can we redesign the technology to make these values come, come true in society, as it were? Can we organize the environment in new ways with uh, laws, rules, regulations, supporting technologies, whatever there is? The environment of the technology can also play a role in the realization of these values. And third, the user. How can we explain the user thing, make the user aware, make the user also somehow critical? How can we empower users to deal with technologies in such a way that the values we find so important, which we found out in stage two, can be enacted in our society? So, so this is an approach that is very practical, and you can do this with stakeholders. You can also do it for yourself as an anticipatory tool. Uh, again, this is not rocket science, but it is an important tool. It has proven to be very helpful, let me say, that, like that uh, in hospitals, at the, I don't know, the police is working with, with it, and people in practices working with, um, well, technologies that are developed partly at places like the University of Twente. So... Um, to end, then, um, the design lab of the UT is a place where these things also fly. And the guidance ethics approach is also uh, partly developed from there. And in design lab, we really try to connect science and technology on the one hand with society on the other hand, not by um, disseminating scientific knowledge towards society, but by starting from society. What are the challenges? What are the issues? And how can we do science to address those challenges? And so with three main focus points in the work of Design Lab, responsible design, citizen science, and transdisciplinary working. And so responsible design is all about developing technologies for societal issues, ranging from responsible robotics to dealing in, uh, in a responsible way with medical research, uh, 
using uh, satellite images to somehow predict uh, uh, that slums might uh, form in specific areas in order to, to take action, etc. So how can we develop technologies from the perspective of society? And how can we do that in a responsible and an ethically acceptable way? Citizen science is another one, engaging society and doing scientific work with all the challenges that it brings. What is good citizen science and what is research integrity and what is academic freedom in the context of citizen science? And of course, the third line is all about not only working between scientific disciplines, but also engaging societal partners in doing scientific work. How does that work? What kind of research ethics does that bring? What kind of challenges does it bring? And so as an example to make it concrete and to conclude, I'm also quite active uh, uh, in the Dutch AI coalition. <laughs> and there the plan is to start all kinds of ELSA labs, ethical, legal and societal aspects labs. Some of them are already starting around poverty, around security, around smart cities. Um, uh, well, one of the ideas uh, that we are toying with at the moment is to see if, if we could foster these ELSA labs or maybe even start one uh, of our own in uh, Twente with this citizen perspective, right? citizen ethics, empowering citizens, empowering people in society to, well, to raise normative issues and to, well, to do that bottom up, uh, uh, inside out type of ethical reflection. Okay, so that was a tour through three lines of ethically relevant work that I happen to be engaged in at the request of uh, Herman. Thank you for the invitation. I hope it's uh, somehow inspiring. And uh, if there are any questions uh, or any other ideas about how we could do things together, please let me know. Thank you. <laughs>